Jesus. I just thank you for this time tonight, Father. I thank you, Lord God, for your presence. I thank you, God, for what you're doing as we are on this journey, Father God. I thank you, Lord God, that you bring to our remembrance everything that we need to remember, God. That, Father God, we won't forget the things that you've been imparted, the revelation you've been giving. God, that is challenging us and is transforming us from the inside out. And, Father, I thank you for tonight. Let it be a night of breakthrough, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that we're preparing to enter into a new year. And, God, I thank you, Lord God, that you're challenging us and want us to leave behind all the old things so that we can embrace a new year and a new season. So, God, I just give you praise for completing this chapter in our life, Father God, so that we can go forward into the newness and the new things that you have for us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you know, um, we, we've been studying about the strongholds and we've been studying about, you know, the double-mindedness. And, you know, in our study, we learned that the two major strongholds in double-mindedness are what? Rejection and rebellion. Rejection and rebellion. Thank you. Um, and so there's things that constantly try to feed those strongholds of rejection and rebellion in our life to what keep us double-minded. Because, you know, in the book of James it says what? He that is double-minded, what, is wavering, right? And unstable. And says that a person like that should what? Not. Expect to not receive anything from God. So this is what the enemy tries to do is he strategizes to try to keep us double-minded. Because why? It cripples our faith. Because also we learned last week what that doubt was actually in rebellion to God. Because we fail to believe God and trust God. And without faith, what? It is impossible to please God. So when we doubt God and we don't trust God, it's actually enforcing rebellion in our life. So we have to deal with that and recognize that when we do that, we're actually rebelling against God. And this hour, he's really drawn the church to a place of coming back to our first love. Amen. That we are forsaking the things of the world. We're forsaking the things that would, you know, get in between us and God. How many know that the enemy is always strategizing to cause something to come between our relationship with God? To allow something to become an idol. Something that's interfering with our romance and intimacy with God. Because once we become one with God in that place of intimacy, that's when his love is really going to deliver us and set us free. Amen. So I want us to study a little bit more about the spiritual adultery and the idolatry because we're going to go somewhere at the end of this teaching. Um, so, but I want you to remember about Hosea. Hosea means what? Deliverance. Remember? And Gomer means complete. God is calling his unfaithful bride, Gomer, to the bridegroom. Hosea, deliverance, is married to. For when we come into perfect unity in our souls with him, and not just in our spirit. See, if, if we, we already know and understand that the Holy Spirit lives in our spirit man. So that's already in unity with God. The problem is, is our soul is not always in unity with God. Because we have a will, we have an opinion, come on. We make choices sometimes that don't agree with God. So sometimes we're not in unity within ourselves with God because of our soulish realm, right? So this unity and oneness will be as Hosea and Gomer when they married and became one flesh. We cannot become complete or achieve complete deliverance until we are married to our bridegroom. In unity with Hosea, our deliverance. So deliverance we need will come as we no longer wander and wander as an unfaithful bride, an adulterous bride, laying down with adulterous, fleshly, worldly, compromising, deceptive partners. But when we choose to say, I do, and become joined with the bridegroom from our depths, from our soul and be renewed in our mind, we give God control of our minds and our will, emotions, and choices until we govern our souls and command it to be in unity with God under subjection to the bridegroom so we are no longer a house divided which will not continue to stand. Until we do this, we will not have complete de deliverance. This union of us, Gomer, the adulterous bride, and Hosea, the bridegroom, will be complete deliverance. See, think about that. Hosea means deliverance, and Gomer means complete. Hosea, remember, he was told to marry Gomer. And Gomer was the adulterous woman. Only God could cause those two names 
and two unlikely people to bring forth complete deliverance as a prophetic picture. Because God knew that Israel, he knew that we were going to be unfaithful. He knew that we were going to have challenges in our relationship with him. So that was a prophetic picture for us to understand that we need to come back to him in that first love. We need to come back to him even though we've been unfaithful in areas of our life. That, that when we come into that place of unity with him, it's going to be complete deliverance. Amen? Gomer was described as a wife of whoredoms. Some say she was a common prostitute in the service of Baal. Her unfaithfulness to her husband, her marriage to Hosea, become a living parable to Israel's unfaithfulness to her husband. Hosea is 13.4, but I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. Restoration of the adulterous bride takes place when Hosea 6, 1 and 2. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind us, bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Amen. Spiritual adultery. God uses in Hosea sexual imagery to describe our desire to hoard after the latest of religious or worldly fads to embrace the world. What is obviously witchcraft, idolatry, carnal, false, or demonically enhanced. It readily em is embraced as long as it is popular and makes us feel good. Remember, that's what we said about the influence of Baal. Baal is the influence of the earth that deceived people and, you know, caused them to do things as long as it felt good. And even if it brought them to a place of compromise, they wanted to, you know, have their flesh and, and their lustly desires fulfilled. So, you know, that saying, if it feels good, do it. Yeah, that was inspired by this force of Baal. Because that's not in the word of God. Because, you know what, you first need to know, is that what God would have you to do? Because God will have you to do things that feel good, but you need to make sure that it's in accordance with his word. Amen? Um, Hosea 2, uh, 14 through 13. When you read it, it, it shows you such a picture. Um, Baal is a great influence over America, as we said. And it's been, it's been stated, you know, by leading leaders that this was a major stronghold in America. Um, Double-mindedness, twisted and confused thinking, ungodly thinking is leading people's hearts from God to follow after the, des the, des the desires and lust of the flesh. We live in a world where it's more honorable to be politically correct than it is to live up and stand up for holiness. The church largely has become apostate, self-centered, and nearly void at times of the power of God due to compromise and bound to idols and being entangled in spiritual adultery. The church seems to be bowing to Baal and falling away from true doctrine and real meaning while the church was established. Matthew 28, 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very ends of this age. See, a lot of times the church has actually gotten away from this. It's about discipling. It's about evangelism. Come on. We're supposed to go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. And then once we get them in, what? We're supposed to disciple them. We're supposed to walk with them until they get strong enough, come on, into the place to where they can go out and make disciples and evangelize. Come on. This is what it's supposed to be about. But see, the, the, the spirits of compromise have come in and it's caused people to get complacent. And so they come into the four walls, and that's it. That's where they get stuck. Yeah. But God is starting to make people feel a little bit uncomfortable in that. He's challenging us because, see, there's more. We have, there's a world out there that we're called to impact. So we have to get forces like compromise out of the, out of the church. We have to get spirits like Baal out of the church. We have to deal with wrong strongholds and wrong mentalities. And we have to understand that we are to impact this world. But first, we have to let God impact us. Amen? So that we can be effective when we go out there. Because if not, we're going to fall prey to some of the things that we're trying to see people set free from. Um, Baal has influenced the church and the worship of God. Has turned into entertainment, man-made businesses, agendas, projects. Compromising with sexual immorality. I mean, if you even look, I've been amazed... You know, as you look at videos on Facebook, 
I, I recently saw one where there's two praise dancers. Anybody see that one? There was two praise dancers doing a worship dance, and they were in dresses up to their thighs. One of them had a slit up to here. I mean, and when she kicked her leg up, you knew what kind of bloomer she had on. I mean, where, where is dignity and holiness in the church? I mean, she really and truly looked like she needed to have a stripper pole. Come on. It was bad. And people were mocking it, but you know what? What needed to happen was somebody needed to go to them young ladies and set them straight. Because that wasn't praising God. That was praising Baal. Yeah, yeah. It was giving worship to the wrong deity. Right. Yeah. If you're going to praise God, it's going to be in the beauty of holiness. Yeah. And there was nothing holy about that. That was bringing attention to flesh. Yeah. And when you're bringing attention to flesh... You're no longer worshiping God that you're trying to serve, that you say you're trying to serve. You are now worshiping forces like Baal. Okay? So we, we got to be careful about that, especially these younger people. I know when we used to do, you know, worship and dance and drama and stuff, you know, we were always after them about their attire when you minister. You know, we would always tell them, make sure when you bend over that you don't show anything in the back, make sure nothing's too tight. I mean, I mean, we had to tell them these things. Because just because it might be okay for you, you think it's okay to in the world, but you can't bring that into the church. Because don't you know that not everybody is sanctified? All right? There's spirits of lust in the church. And you know what, people? You know, you sometimes don't control their eyeballs and their minds. So don't present yourself like that so that you are inviting a spirit of lust. You know, I, I just challenged one young lady I know and told her, you, that's twerking. That's twerking. Mm -hmm. It is a sexual dance. When you look it up, when you Google it, it tells you it's a sexual dance. This younger generation does not have any self-respect. No self-respect. If you can stand there and video yourself twerking and put it out there for the world to see with their spirits of lust and perversion, they're going to look at it. Come on. You have no self-respect. That's why it's important that we minister to these young girls. Because they have to have self-respect. You know, it's nothing for girls to allow guys now to talk to them and belittle them and trash them and, and just put labels on them. And they accept it because they think this is love. This is not love. You're being abused by a spirit. Come on. We need to pray for this generation. And it's in the church, unfortunately. Um, um, let's see. We need programs that do not fail at empowering the church. You know, because spiritual warfare is prevalent. Um, too much of assembling of the world's ways. Too much resembling the world's ways. 2 Corinthians 6.17 Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the world. Touch not no unclean thing and I will receive you. You know, a lot of times, what I found in my life, when God's calling me to separate from something and separate to Him, you get to feel like you're out there by yourself. You get to feel like, <laughs> where are you at, God? You get to feel like, you know, I want you to touch me, you know, but you come to that place where God is saying, come after me. In order to come after me, you're going to have to let something go. You're going to have to separate from something that I'm causing you to lay down as a requirement for going to that next dimension with me. Because once you meet that requirement, what does he say? Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. A lot of times we don't feel received because there's something in our lives that God, what, is trying to require that we give him. Um, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, like it says, says, come out from them and be separate. It says, Lord, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. This is why so many people feel separated and forsaken and abandoned. Feeling separated from God means God is desiring you, like I said, to separate from something that stands in the way of him. It stands as, as in opposition to the intimacy he desires between you and him. Feeling as one with God, accepted and not forsaken. We need some separation from the world and to be separated unto God. Holiness. Holiness. Because in that atmosphere of holiness, that's where complete deliverance is going to come. You know, it's like the Gomer and the Hosea that we just talked about a little bit more.
complete deliverance is going to come when you come into that place of intimacy and you lay down all that you know that God's requiring. When you lay yourself down, he's going to overtake you in a way that you know that you know that you know that you are one with God. There's a new dimension. That's all I can say is that I keep feeling that he's calling us to this new dimension in him of being one with him in such a way that these things are no longer issues. Because his love is going to drive them out. So he's been shifting our mind. He's been challenging us in some areas as a requirement from us. You know, it's pro we're proving to him that, God, we want this. You know, that we want this more than we want the strongholds. We want this more than the worldly ways that you're challenging us. We want this more than the mindsets of yesterday. God, we're laying this stuff down. We're in hot pursuit for you, God. We, we know and recognize that we've been Gomer. We've been the adulterous bride. But now, God, we're coming in union with our Homer, and we want complete deliverance. Amen? Amen? So this is where he's drawing us to. A place of intimacy. You know, like that dream that I had, and I think I shared it on Facebook, and, and the Lord just keeps bringing it back to my remembrance. About that dream I had where it was, it was like the Holy Spirit had me floating above the sanctuary, and I could see the hand of God was just going in and out of the rows. And, and I saw hearts that were broken. And I saw yieldedness on their face. And I saw hands and hearts lifted. And wherever there were open, wherever God, the hand of God could get in, it went in. And you could see them working on their heart. You could see them touching their bodies. You could see them bringing restoration and deliverance and healing. It was just like everywhere they were open, the hand of God touched. And it wasn't no man. It was just the spirit of God, the love of God touching people just because they were open to God. See, that's what he's doing right now. He's causing us to be open to God because those things that we've had in our lives, those things that we've held on to, those things of the world, those things of the past, they've been barriers to God. It's kept us closed up. It's been walls. And he's tearing them down. He's renewing our mind is confronting the strongholds because these limits God and the limits our openness to God our abandonment to God he's confronting that because he wants to reveal his glory come on does anybody feel the spirit of God in this I can't hardly keep up with it He's saying, I want you to abandon to me. Yes, you've been abandoned by the world. Yes, you've been abandoned by people that you thought that loved you and said that they were going to take care of you. You were abandoned by your parents. You were abandoned by loved ones. But my love is adopting you. And my love is drawing you to a place that you've never been before. My love is desiring to heal and to set you apart and, and to equip you and to anoint you and to send you forth and to fill you up and to fill every void that you have in your life. Every void. Carol, God says he wants to fill every void in your life. For years, even maybe in your lifetime, you've always felt on the outside looking in. And God says, let me have that wall. Let me have that hurt. Let me have that pain. Let me pull down those strongholds, even those cultural strongholds that you even find yourself dealing with. God says, in me, there is no cultural strongholds. I want to, I want to eradicate those things. I want to conform your mind. I want to transform your mind. I want to give you my mind because you have a teacher's anointing on you. You have a heart for the broken people. You have a prophetic voice. And the enemy has done everything he could to keep you bound and to keep you pushed in the corner and to keep you pushed down. But God says this hour, if you just lean on me, this hour, if you just abandon yourself to me, I'm going to set you free in ways that you've never, never known before, but it's been what you've been crying out for, says God. See, that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing this hour. That's what he's doing for all of us. It's about being abandoned. Can you imagine if we abandon ourselves to God like this? What will happen? We will cause a revolution in this, this area that will not be able to be contained in this area. It will go across this city. Come on. Come on. We're talking about reformation. God is reforming us. He's transforming us so that we can impact cities and regions and nations. It has to start somewhere. Come on. That's what he's doing. He's starting something in you. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know where I'm at. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Idolatry, I said, is when anything or anyone gets 
what only God deserves. So when we have these strongholds, when we have these idols, come on, and we give in to them and we allow them to remain, we're actually giving them parts of us that God deserves. We're actually giving them attention that God deserves. We're actually bound to them when we should be bound to God. Come on. Because when you have a stronghold, a mindset, an influence, an addiction, what? You spend time on that thing. You meditate on that thing. You get bombarded by that thing. You get tormented by that thing. Your mind gets taken over by that thing. Instead of meditating on the word of God, come on, he said, what? He whose mind is stayed on me will be in what? Complete peace. Perfect peace. When we don't have our mind stayed on God and those strongholds and those things in our mind that are bombarding us, come on, we lose our peace. Because it's an idol. It's an idol. Remember what um, Elijah said to Jezebel? He said, do you come and, um, who was it, Obed, I think it was. He come to meet Elijah, and he said, do you come in peace? He said, how can there be peace when your mother Jezebel is around in her witchcraft and idolatry? Come on. When you have witchcraft and idolatry around you, you lose your peace. Come on. That's the very first sign. Very first sign. I have been in such battles with witchcraft and occult that I have actually felt like I was being gnawed on by piranhas. Come on. You just feel it in the spirit. Come on. Revelation 2.20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed by idols. View of spiritual adultery, Matthew 12, 38 and 39. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of prophet Jonah. Come on. You need to grab a hold of that. Uh, Luke eleven sixteen. 16. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. First view of spiritual adultery is seeking signs because it's attributable, attributable to unbelievers. Spiritual adultery, he said, was what evil generation. Matthew 16, 4. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Spiritual adultery equals what a wicked generation. Mark 8 through 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Spiritual adultery rejects the Word of God. Jesus created a link between the request for a sign and adultery with the term hypocrites. And that's Matthew 16, 1 through 4. Spiritual adultery equals what? Deception. Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, this is why God says don't always look for a sign. Because if you count on the sign to be the indicator, you, go, you could possibly be deceived. Because you have to know in your knower, you have to trust God and believe in God even when there's no sign. False prophets of Baal, Philippians 3, 18 through 20. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Prophesying, worshiping, trying to live saved in our own ability, nature, flesh, can open the door for us to be seduced by the counterfeit as the false prophets of Baal. False prophets of Baal or otherwise, they deliver whatever message they believe will bring them money, fame, notoriety, power, or influence. They desire popularity with impure motives. They are not concerned about truth. This is not a popular message. Okay? I'm not in here patacaking and prophesying what everybody might want to hear. Okay? This is not popular. But now let somebody say they're going to have signs and wonders. Let somebody say they prophet so-and-so and so when they're going to prophesy the house now. The place is packed. There's perversion in the body of Christ. And there's deception in the body of Christ. 
I can look on Facebook and you can see some prophets that are trying to build a harem and they're not worried about building the body of Christ. Some of them you can look in their eyes and you can see lust. Come on. Run from a prophet like that. Because he's only going to tell you something that's going to snare your soul. We have to know that we know who we're dealing with. One area of bail influence, like we said before, is doubt. Wavering in opinion, double-minded. Doubt enforces the rebellion, stronghold, and double-mindedness. And why am I saying this again? One, I want us to grab a hold of it. Two, is under the influence of bail. Okay? And we're going to deal with bail in just a few minutes. Um, James 1.6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God would believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that is what? That is believing in God without a sign, Right? Matthew 21, 22. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. That's why a lot of us don't receive. Amen? Because we pray the prayer, but we have doubt inside of us that combats the prayer. It says, if you ask in faith. Amen? Matthew 14, 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? We sometimes trust more in self than we do God. Thus, we doubt God can do what we're asking. Jeremiah 17, 5, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean unto our own understanding. The enemy wants us to remain in, our, in areas of spiritual adultery and idolatry under the influence of Baals. He wants us to remain in our carnal nature, operating on the influence of a stronghold of doubt or unbelief. For then faith is canceled out. We walk in flesh and not spirit. And without faith in God, like we said, it is impossible to please God. How many want to be pleasing to God? Yeah, yeah. So what do we got to have? Faith. Faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Mark 9, 23, and Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Amen? All things are possible if we believe. And I want to, um, let's see, where's that? Let's go to 2 Corinthians um, 14 through 18. Um, I didn't write that down. Carol, are you back there? Yeah. You want to pull that up for me, please? Please, please, please. 2 Corinthians, which chapter? Um, four, uh, you know what? Forget that one. I didn't write it all down. I, did, I messed up on that one. Okay, let's go down. Compromise is a way of reaching agreement in which a person or group give up something or gives in by adjustment. To come into a place of unity with someone who has conflicting or opposing terms or principles. It is to bind by a mutual agreement. Did you hear that? Compromise is to bind by a mutual agreement. Think about that in not a good term. Think about that in dealing with the enemy. Say you give some of your ground up to the enemy. You compromised. So what have you now done? You have bound yourself by what? A mutual agreement. You have now come into agreement with that enemy. That's what happens when we compromise. We think, oh, it's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It don't hurt. But yes, it does. Because it binds you because you're now into agreement with your enemy. Um, it is to find a way between extremes, a meeting in the middle, to cause impairment, <laughs> to, 
to cause impairment and to breach a security system. Come on, that's the definition of compromise. To cause impairment and to breach a security system. The Spirit of God is your security system. And when you compromise, you've allowed a breach in His protection. Come on. James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 1 Kings 18.21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver before two opinions? If the Lord is if God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. They weren't willing to give up. With their, their, in the area of compromise. They were comfortable with it. It was good for them to be able to live in both worlds. Come on. This is most of the church. This is most of the body of Christ. They want to live in both worlds. They like to come and celebrate on Sunday morning, Wednesday night as they come, but then the rest of the week, they want to live like the world. Come on, talk like the world. <coughs> Live like the world, do like the world, and then all of a sudden they get holy again on Sunday morning. It's compromise, and it's going to send people to hell because they're deceived and thinking that they're saved and okay. But if you're living in compromise, the enemy has a breach, he has a hold of you somewhere in your life that if you don't get a handle of it, he's going to take more ground in your life. Because what happens is when we begin to compromise in areas, we begin to lose sensitivity to the Spirit of God. And once we begin to lose sensitivity to the Spirit of God, it may be just a little thing now, but it's going to grow. Okay? It's like cigarettes. You smoke a cigarette today. You get around some people that smoke pot. Next thing you know, you're smoking some pot. Then you get around some people doing crap. Then you know what? Because you lost your sensitivity and don't think anything's wrong about the cigarettes or the pot, and now you're going to graduate to crack. You see what I'm saying? And they always said marijuana was a, was a gateway drug, and, and I believe that. Because a lot of people are deceived right now thinking marijuana is okay. But it's not. It's a gateway drug. It's deception. It's witchcraft. It's a cult. And it's keeping the enemy having a strong hold on some lives. Amen? And now you see that marijuana is being, you know, made legal in states. And people are rejoicing. But they don't understand in the spirit what's happening to their lives. That's scripture. Okay. Here it is. Hosea 2.14. I'm going to start there. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, the creatures that move along the ground, bow and sword, I mean, bow and sword in battle. I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil. And they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land and I will show my love to the one I call not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. Now you see here, this is a picture of restoration for the adulterous woman. 
the adulterer's bride. Because he said, what? I'm going to lure her in her wilderness. So a lot of times what happens in the wilderness is a place of isolation. It's a place of separation, right? And this is a time for three major things that will happen when you're in the wilderness. Preparation for what God has for us. Number two, a life-changing opportunity. And number three, personal transformation. And you see, he said, what? I'm going to draw her there. And I'm going to give her back her vineyards. See, during this time of being in the wilderness, he's preparing us. He's giving us life-changing opportunities. He's bringing forth personal transformation. And then he says, what? I'm going to speak tenderly to her in her wilderness. I'm going to give her back her vineyards in her wilderness. Come on. I'll make the valley of Achor a door of hope. So he's going to give you a doorway in your wilderness. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days of our first love, when we came out of Egypt. And that day declares the Lord, you're going to call me husband. You're going to be one with God and he's going to be your husband. You're no longer going to call me master. See, you're coming from that place of just being in service to him, but you're coming into a place of intimacy and being one with him and you're going to call him husband. And he's going to remove the names of the Baals from your lips. Come on. Deliverance. Deliverance. And in that day, I mean 20, he says, I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. And in that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and the olive oil. Come on, this is release that's going to come in the restoration. And they will respond to Jezreel and Jezreel what is a land of revelation. I will show my love to the one that I called, not my loved one. See, when we're the adulterous bride, come on. And you know, he, he said, not my loved one, but now he's calling his beloved. I will call those not my people. You are my people. And they will say you are my God. Come on. We've been in a time of wilderness. And we didn't see the big picture at times. We just thought that God had forsaken us and forgot about us and abandoned us. And the whole time he's saying, no, I'm preparing you. For what I have for you. I'm changing you. Because there's an opportunity that's getting ready to happen. And I'm bringing forth personal transformation. That's going to open the door for restoration. And all these things that you've lacked in this season. All these things that you needed in this season. All these things that you think you need. Come on. All the things I promised you. You're about to begin to see be released into your life. So that's why we go through this wilderness, and you know what? He said, I'm going to allure her there. I'm going to draw her there. It was the plan of God. It wasn't that you just, you know, you stumbled in there by accident. God drew you. He wooed you. He said, I'm going to allure her there. It was God's plan and his design to draw you as his adulterous bride to this wilderness. Because there, he's going to deal with your spiritual adultery. He's going to remove the names of Baal from your life and from your lips. Those adulterous and idolatrous things that have been in our life. He's going to remove them. Come on, and there's going to be restoration. I was excited when I got that. Because, you know, when you're in the wilderness, you think... It's just because you've messed up so bad. You think it's because God has forsaken you and forgotten you. But when you read it in Hosea, he says, I alert you to the wilderness. I drew you to the wilderness. Come on, you've got to understand that. Because in that scripture, it shows you the process that we're in right now. He said, what? I'm going to lure you into the wilderness. I'm going to draw you there. And then in this wilderness, I'm going to begin to give you back. Yeah. Come on. I'm going to take the, the names of Baal off your lips. Come on. 
This is the plan of God. Because in this wilderness, we're being prepared. Remember the three things in the wilderness. Pastor Sandy stepped out, so I'm going to say them again. You can hear it again. It'll be good for you. Three things that happen in the wilderness is preparation for what God has for us. Life-changing opportunity and personal transformation. And that's basically come from Hosea chapter 2. So when we think about being in the wilderness and God bringing personal transformation, and he specifically says he's going to wipe the names of Baal off of our lips, that means that those things he's going to deal with, those things that would cause us to bow to these demonic forces and be ensnared by these idols and spiritual adultery, he's going to wipe it off our lips. Come on. If he wipes it off our lips, that means it's out of our heart. Come on. Because whatever is in our heart comes out our mouth. Come on. So if he wipes it off our lips, that means it's no longer in our heart. It's no longer in our mind. It's no longer a part of who we are. It's no longer a part of our soul. Because if not, we're going to speak things that are going to get in agreement with it if it's a part of who we are. Come on. He says he's going to wipe. Come on. He's going to remove. Sorry. He says he's going to remove. Come on. He's going to remove the names of the Baals from our lips. And no longer will their names be invoked. And in that day I'll make a covenant for them. See? This Baal and these things that we deal with cause us to break that covenant. So we need a renewed covenant. As we come out of agreement with these things and God begins to remove them and wipe them out of our life, come on, we need that fractured covenant renewed. Because these areas that we've been deceived in, these areas that we've allowed to bring compromise, these areas that we have allowed to be in our mind and our heart and our life, they've caused us to break covenant with God. And I believe that's why a lot of people are, are having hard times in areas that God, you know, has already said that we're in a covenant together. This is your birthright. But you know what? I believe that's because we need to see restoration in this area. Because of the things that we allowed to break covenant. Um, so this is what I want to do. Because everybody knows they have a birthright, right? And everybody knows that God's drawing us to be one with him. So this is what I want to do from this point. I want us to officially divorce Baal tonight. This is your divorce decree. And I want us, I don't know if I have one, give me one, let's see if we have enough. I want you to look it over a second. And does everybody have something to write with? Does everybody have a pen? And when we declare this, I want you to mean it. I want you to divorce Baal. I want it to be wiped off of your lips. I want you to stand in the gap for your family. I want this to apply to your bloodline. Come on. There's a lot of inherited things that people are caught up in that are under this influence. We need to stand in the gap for our bloodline. Okay, we're going to go through this together, okay? And you can put your name there. And, and regarding the marriage of, who are you? Write your name there. Versus the principality of Baal, including Baal, Queen of Heaven, and Leviathan.
and this is your decree of divorce. Come on, get excited. Because if you grab a hold of this spiritually and you invoke this thing and believe it is real, Hallelujah. come on. Are y'all reading it? Okay. On this day. Come on. December 15th. This matter comes on for hearing before the supreme judge of the highest court of the kingdom of God in the petition of, come on. We want a divorce, right? Yes. Yes. Seeking a decree of divorce from the Principality of Baal, the defendant in this matter. The court finds the plaintiff's assertions are fully substantiated. That this marriage was entered into by the plaintiff based on the lies and deceit by the defendant. Come on. And the plaintiff relied on fraudulent inducements and enticements by the defendant, which the defendant had neither the intention nor ability to deliver. The plaintiff renounces any and all right claim or interest in any possession jointly acquired with the defendant during this marriage. And that plaintiff is entitled to have sole right claim and interest into all the gifts, possessions, and inheritance from the plaintiff's father. And defendant is to be and forever barred from the title, control, or use of any such gifts, possessions, or inheritance. Come on. Come on. You need to stand up and you need to declare that. Come on. Everybody stand up and declare number two. Come on. Come on. This is real. Come on. Declare a thing and it shall be established. Come on. Come on. The plaintiff. Come on. One, two, three. The plaintiff renounces any and all right, claim, or interest in any possession jointly acquired with the defendant during this marriage. And that plaintiff is entitled to have sole right, claim, and interest into all the gifts, possessions, and interest inheritance from the plaintiff's father. And defendant is to be and forever barred. Come on. Forever barred. Come on. Forever barred from the title, control, or use of any such gifts, possessions or inheritance. Come on. That all the offspring of the marriage have been stillborn, have had viability or brief periods and were either destroyed by the defendant or were so infected by sickness attributed to the defendant's condition that no life remained in them. The plaintiff repudiates any and all joint claims with the defendant and requests this court to sever all relationships with the defendant of any nature, however and whenever such occurred, and seeks enforcement by the court of plaintiffs desire to be known by no other name than what's given by um, plaintiff's father. The plaintiff also seeks an everlasting restraining order against the defendant so as to keep the defendant away from all persons or property belonging to the plaintiff. Come on. That's you. You're the plaintiff. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Um, the, the, the judgment. The, wherefore, this court being fully advised in the evidence does fine for the plaintiff and against the defendant in all matters material to the plaintiff's petition of divorce and does by this decree grant the plaintiff a divorce and all requests set forth above that being the order of this court from and there after this date so shall it be the supreme judge the plaintiff's degree the defining of the court for the plaintiff the plaintiff now makes the following decree on the 7th December 15th 2013 I Ruth Mamma McCormick, do hereby decree. Come on, put your name in there. On behalf of my family and our future generations, that we no longer have any ties with Bell Hammond. We are titles and doers, and therefore we are rightful heirs to the great transfer of wealth to the church. We no longer have any ties with Bell Bereth. We are not free to choose to remarry Jehovah, the only true God, and be an everlasting covenant and relationship with Him. Come on, we reclaim our sexual innocence and purity. We work in holiness and we reject every form of sexual perversion, homosexuality, and sexual immorality. We are for the next generation. We are for the unborn's right to life. We will pray and support the next generation to see God's governmental burst purposes fulfilled in them. We no longer have any ties with any form of witchcraft and occult spirits. Come on! Come on, hallelujah. 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 Come on now. 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 Declare I am divorced. Come on, I declare I'm divorced from the bell spirit. Come 
gone and everything that it brought into my life. I am divorced from it now. And my bloodline is divorced from it now in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. And we actually even cancel that contract with this church in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Now. Break this one. 
David, you come up here too, please, can you? In Jesus' name. And this is veil of the storms. Come on. We break the contract with every spiritual storm that is instigated by the spirit of Baal now in the name of Jesus. to be the husband, the land over ruler, and master. Come on. We sever again this contract. We tear it up in Jesus' name. And we declare you have no power over our lives, over our bloodline, over this church. Come on. Everything that pertains to us, you will no longer contaminate or defile in the name of Jesus. We break this contract and we declare that it's covered with the blood of Jesus now in Jesus' name. Come on. Now, let's give God some praise. Praise Him for your deliverance. Come on, praise Him for your deliverance. Praise Him for your deliverance. Praise Him. You got to believe that something happened in the Spirit. Come on. It wasn't just pieces of paper. You got to believe that something transpired in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Did you hear something? She may have already said this, but I really feel this in my spirit, especially for this church, that um, sometimes what happens, and we don't realize, whenever we make that contract and we get married to, to this, this Baal, this false god, um, just like she said, that Baal represents a husband. And sometimes what happens is we don't realize, but our if these things begin to affect our relationships, because this, this, this demonic god is very jealous. So in other words, if he's married to us, we, he doesn't want us to be joined with any other. So sometimes we begin to notice that our friendships begin to, to begin to wane off. And even our covenant relationships with other churches, Pastor Sandy, begin to kind of become affected because of this veil. And I truly believe tonight, because we, we, we wrote a decree and decreed a uh, divorce from this veil, from this husband, that I believe that the Spirit of the Lord is about to rekindle a lot of relationships, a lot of relationships, even a lot of covenant relationships between our other churches and other ministries, and even personal relationships that we have on our own. I believe that the Spirit of God is, begin to, is going to begin to breathe on that and speak life and breathe life back into dead relationships, old relationships, stuff that seems that that it fell apart and, and, and it fell off and it just dried up. I believe I believe the Spirit of God is about to breathe on that and He's about to come forth. He's about to show you just how of a husband that He is, just how much of a lover that He is. He's about to spend time with some of you all, and you're about to begin to conceive something. I said it this morning, but we're walking in the season to where we're got we're going to acknowledge that we're pregnant with something, but we have to conceive it first. Because we divorced Baal, we're now has the opportunity to conceive right. of the Holy That's Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this is the fun part. We're going to acknowledge our marriage to God. So, can you help me? Can you pass these out? Can y'all pass these out? Pastor Sandy, since you're the priest of the house, would you do you mind coming up and leading us in this one? I'm sorry. Alright? Yeah. 
certificate of marriage. Be it known to all in heaven and on earth, we, the beloved of God and the Lord of all, do by these presents make known that we have on this 15th day of December 2013 by solemn vow covenant to be forever bound to one another. I, the Lord, declare you will call me husband. In Hosea 2.16, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in, in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness. We, the beloved of God, declare we acknowledge you alone. You are my God. It is you alone that we will be faithful. We will know no other. We, the beloved of God, do acknowledge, do acknowledge and declare. We betroth you in our righteousness and justice, in our love and companion. It is you, our God. We betroth in faithfulness. We acknowledge you alone as our provider, and will at all times look to you. And here too do we make our sacred promise. Thank you, Father. We receive it in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Father God, that we are married to you, Father. Lord, that we are lovers of your soul, and lovers of your anointing, lovers of your glory, lovers of what you have for us, Father. Lord, that your word is what makes us. Lord, your word is what we love to hear. Your, your word is what we walk in. Your word is what just speaks to our heart and brings us peace and joy and righteousness. Lord, it's your word, Father. We thank you. We love you, Lord. Lord, we are madly in love with you. God, we are more in love with you than anything else, Father God. You are the thing that consumes us, Father. We're consumed, Father, by you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that no matter what goes on around us, it doesn't make any difference what is happening in our lives, God. It's you, Lord. We know that you are the lover of our souls and that you take care of us, Father. And we give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Do you mind coming here and praying for your generation? I was actually wondering if I could come in and speak on my generation. Come in and speak on your... Yes, you got something to say right now? Yes, ma'am. I'm here to speak on behalf of my generation, the generation that has come up with demonic things such as twerking and fame on Twitter, fame on Facebook, fame on things that is not of this church. I don't know about you, but you can't follow Jesus on Facebook. You can't follow Jesus on Twitter. You can't Snapchat with Jesus. On behalf of my generation. You see this shirt? This shirt says Superman, but that's not what it is. Jesus is the only man it is who is super. He has strength beyond strength. He has sight beyond sight. He has a voice beyond voice. And I say right now, that word right there in the middle, evangelist. I've always believed that if you hear that you are prophesied three different times within the same 24 hours of the same thing, it is God sent to you. There has been the word evangelist there. They have spoken here. And on the way to the mall today, I was told by that woman there that I am called to be evangelist. I am called to be a speaker of the Lord. I am called to be the Savior of our generation by the Word of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for igniting that fire in Him, God, and that boldness, God. God, I just thank you, Father God, for this young man, God. I thank you for the boldness and the fire. Yes, God, I can see him being, Father God, a firebrand, a forerunner, a Nazarite for you, God. I can see the fire of God on him, God. And I ask that you continue to consume him, Father God, and let his heart burn with passion for you, God. Let it be a light in front of this generation, God. Let it begin to lead them out of darkness into the truth and the light, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glenn, why don't you come up and pray for him too because you're an evangelist. Yes. And Tracy, why don't you both of you tag team? Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Yes, Lord. Yes. Father God, more than all, Father God, I ask you to give the godly wisdom that it needs, God. Yes, Lord. Godly wisdom, Father. Yes, Lord. Your guidance. Yes, Lord. Your anointing. Yes, Lord. Not his own, but your anointing, yes, Father Lord. God. Anoint to heal. Yes, anoint to set free, God. Yes, Lord. Anoint to say a word, God, and yes, you're Lord. there. Yes, Lord. Father God, I thank you right now, Father God, in Jesus' name, that you're going to move. You're going to move in his yes, generation. Yes, yes. Every word that comes out of his mouth will not come back for it in Jesus' name. He can't say, no, my son, I go to the Lord. You feel his mouth. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, that you give him what to say. God, that you lead him to who he needs to go to. And God, I thank you, Lord God, that his words are going to be like arrows of deliverance, Father God. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Let your love fill every void, Father, and draw him, Father God, to that place. Yes, Lord. People will see the love. Yes, Father. Not him, but your love. Yes, Lord. Because love will break everything. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yes, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing tonight, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, we're going to, we're not done yet. Now's the fun part. Come on, we get to worship God. Come on. You know what to do. Come on, David. Let's get in the presence of the Lord. Amen. for me. 
and it is our prize. And we're drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean that we're all, all sinking. So heaven beats earth like an unforeseen kiss in my heart turns by the thee inside of my chest and I don't I don't have time to maintain these regrets I think about when I think about how he loves me How he loves me, oh, 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 he loves me. yes, he loves me. Who would cry out to me? And think about 
crying is that when a baby cries, we tend to it immediately. We try to feed it or change it or sometimes just love on it. And sometimes what we need to do is just begin to cry out to God. And just say, God, I just need you to love on me. I don't need anything from you. I don't, I don't want to be changed. I don't want to fool. I just need you to love on me. Wrap me in your loving arms and just love on me, Jesus. Just love on me, God. When all the world sometimes seems so unlovable, God, when we just seem not to be able to find your love, no matter where it looks, God, but we cry out tonight and God say, just love us. Just love us, Lord. We want to sit in your lap, God. No matter how, the, how what happened this week or what happened this month or even what happened throughout this year, God, but we just need to, we just need you to love us, God. Wrap us in your presence. Ooh. Oh. Carol, the song, you may not have it, but I really feel in my spirit to really sing this one last song. And this song is literally the story of my life. And it's about just saying, God, I just cry out to you because I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you, God. I need you so much, Jesus. Nothing else in this world is going to take your place, God. Nothing else can satisfy me like you do, God. I just need you, Lord. Because I know there is a God who loves me. And he wraps me in his loving arms. There is a God who loves me. And he wraps me in his arms. And that is the place where I'm changed. And that's where I'm Yeah. 
Take me to that place, Lord. To that secret place where I can be with you, just you and me, God. And you can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms, your arms, your, your, oh, oh. Nothing 
for me.
in our life. Yes. You know, just as he said that, you know, Baal, he, he wars, he, he's jealous too, he, he wants to consume us. But once we break those contracts and we recognize his sneaky ways and we start to separate ourselves from those things, you know, God wants to fill those areas. He wants to take hold of us in these ways, in these areas. So if you haven't felt God rest on you and you need prayer, I don't want to leave here without you feeling this new touch that I feel that is coming in here and settling. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Deanna, you need prayer. Look at me like that. Come here. Look at me like that. Come here. 